Hello, it's Arkasha from MCAT Simplified. So today we're going to be discussing how to determine the isoelectric point for a peptide or a protein. Okay, so here we have this peptide. And it's a tetrapeptide, so there's really four amino acids. You can count the alpha carbons, right? One, two, three, and then four. And it has its amino end and its carboxyl end, the, the amino and carboxyl terminals. And you know, some side chains. So to, to begin, let's just identify what these amino acids are composing this whole peptide, okay? So here we have a CH2 and a carboxyl group. So that's going to be alanine, or sorry, not alanine, that's uh, aspartate, aspartic acid, so uh, D, okay? And then we have this group, so we have a bunch of CH2s and then an amino group, that's actually lysine, K. And then here we have just a simple methyl side chain, that's going to be alanine. And then here we have CH2, CH2, and then a carboxyl group. So that's one more carbon than aspartate or aspartic acid. That's glutamate or E, all right? So notice that only one of these amino acids is non-ionizable or has a non-ionizable side chain. The remaining three, aspartate, lysine, and glutamate, all have ionizable side chains. So they each have their own PKAs, which is going to be important to determine the isoelectric point of this entire peptide. And then notice that since it's a chain, right, you only have one amino group that's ionizable and then one carboxyl group that's ionizable, which again, we're going to call the, the carboxyl group, the backbone carboxyl group, PKA1, and then PKA2 is going to correspond to that amino group, all right, just to keep it consistent. And then we're going to assign PKAs to the other ionizable side chains. So we'll say that PKA3 for this glutamate side chain is going to be around four, the PKA4, PKA4 for this aspartate side chain is going to be around 6. And then the PKA5 for this lysine side chain is going to be 12. All right. And again, those aren't exact values, but again, it'll work for this example. The real values should be given to you typically if you're asked a problem like this on the MCAT or in your biochem class. Now, whenever, so our, our goal here is going to be to figure out at which, at which pH is the Zwitter ion form of this molecule or the neutral form essentially of this molecule predominant. And that's gonna be the isoelectric point, okay? Now, the way that to approach problems like this, right? Because you know, you ask yourself, well, how are we gonna do this? We have all these side chains, all these PKs. The best way to approach problems like this is going to be to pretend that the initial pH, we're gonna set the initial pH of our hypothetical titration to zero, all right? And we're gonna determine what the net charge at that pH is gonna be. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to increase the pH to different points and we're gonna see what the net charge is, right? And first we're going to identify, right? You know, when we have positively charged forms, negatively charged forms and then neutral forms, right? Using that method, okay? And then to determine specifically the PI, right? We're going to determine two points. We're gonna determine point A and point B or the pHs at those, pHA and pHB. And remember that one way of thinking about, you know, where that neutral form predominates is we got to figure out the pH. It's basically going to predominate at a pH between this pHA where the concentration of the peptide when it's positively has a plus one charge overall is equal to the concentration of the peptide when it has a neutral charge overall. And so we need that pH sub A and then pH sub B is going to be where the concentration of the neutral peptide is equal to the concentration, exactly equal to the concentration of the peptide with exactly minus one charge. That's point B. And essentially the PI or the isoelectric point is going to be exactly in between these two points. That's going to be the pH where the neutral form is going to exist at the highest concentration. So that's what we're going to do. So let's start again, pretending that we're at a pH of zero. And remember that for every pKa, if the pKa is greater than the pH, then that group is going to be protonated. And then if the pKa is less than the pH, that group is going to be deprotonated. So at a pH of zero, all the pKa's are going to be higher than that pH. So they're all going to be protonated. And that's how this peptide is drawn to begin with, right? We have a positive charge here, neutral here, positive charge here, neutral here, and neutral here, all right? And then positive charge here. And so overall, at pH of zero, we only have two charged groups, the amino terminal on this lysine side chain. So that's going to be a net charge of plus two. And that's what we're going to write 
here, plus two at zero. Now, then we, we're going to increase the pH just above the pKa, or, or just above the pKa of the group with the smallest pKa value, which is going to be this carboxyl terminal group. And so the pH is three, right? If the pH is three, this group is going to now be deprotonated, negatively charged. But then all the other groups are going to stay as they are because still all the other groups, their pKa's are going to be higher than the pH of three. So now we have two positively charged groups and one negatively charged group. So that's going to be negative uh, or po positive, two, positive one. Okay, positive one. Now, okay, notice that here, positive one, okay, in this species, has a po it has a positive one overall charge, right? And if we then increase the pH to five, all right, if we increase the pH to five, then this group is going to start getting depronated because now the pH is going to be greater. It's going to be greater than, than the pKa of this glutamate side chain. So now this is going to start getting depronated. And notice that now if you have molecules like this, you have two negative charges and two positive charges. So the net charge there is actually zero. Okay. Now, as it turns out, okay, this pKa3 here, okay, that's actually going to be equal to pH sub A, pH sub A. So that's actually going to be four. And the reason is, remember, that when the pH is equal to the pKa, exactly half of the group, exactly half of the group is deprotonated, or exactly half of the molecules have that group deprotonated, and then exactly half of the molecules have that group still protonated. So if you're going, if you're deprotonating this, right, if you're deprotonating from this, the, the protonated form where it's OH and neutral, you're deprotonating it. It's initially at a plus one charge, a plus one charge. And then you deprotonate it and it goes to an overall neutral charge, okay? And remember that at this pKa, when the pH is equal to this pKa, exactly half of this group, exactly half of this group is going to be protonated. And therefore, overall, exactly half of the peptide is going to have a plus one charge, right? And exactly half of it is going to be deprotonated. And therefore, exactly half of the peptide is going to have a neutral charge. And that's what we were looking for with, point, with pH sub A, right? So that happens to also be equal to pKa3 in this case, all right? Now, so we found that. Now, if we increase the pH even further, we're going to get pH of 7, okay? So pH of 7, let's just say we, we got it to that point. Then we're going to start deprotonating this group. So this is now going to be negatively charged, all right? And now overall, right, this is going to have uh, a negative one overall charge because there's three negative negatively charged groups and two positively charged groups. So plus three minus plus two minus three is going to be negative one. So this is going to be negative one. And notice again, this actually P pH sub B turns out to be equal to six of pKa four, right? And again, we're we're going to use the same logic, right? Imagine if this group is protonated. So if this group is protonated, this whole thing as we've established, uh, has a neutral charge, zero charge, right? So peptide of zero. But then when you deprotonate it, it goes to negative one, negative one. And so the pKa4 is when exactly half of this peptide has this group protonated and exists therefore in a neutral charge. And then exactly half of it, the remaining half, has a deprotonated and has a negative one charge overall. So the neutrally charged peptide at pKa4 is going to be have a concentration equal to the peptide in its negative one charge state. And so that's why pHb is going to be six or equal to pKa4. Okay. Now, before we analyze this and, and how we get the isoelectric point from this, let's continue the titration. So when we get to pH of 11, right now it's above that pKa2 of, PK of that amino group. Sorry pKa of 2 that amino group, which is 10. So now this, this nitrogen gets deprotonated. It now goes into its neutral form. And so we've lost that positive charge, but we still have these three negative charges and that plus one charge. So now the whole peptide is going to be negative two. And then lastly, if we increase the pH 
above the PK5, the last PK, that group's going to get deprotonated, right? That group's going to get deprotonated. And now we have no positive charges in the three negative charges, so the overall net charge of that pH is going to be negative three, okay? So now, again, we got to figure out what is the PI, the isoelectric point, okay? So the isoelectric point, as we established at the beginning, is going to be the average, actually, of these two pHs, right? Because it's going to be right in the middle between when point A, when the concentration of the, of the plus one charged peptide is, e is exactly equal to the, the concentration of the neutral peptide, right? Between that point A and then point B, when the, the concentration of the neutral peptide is exactly equal to the, the concentration of the peptide in the negative one form. So exact, at the pH exactly between those two pHs is going to be where the, the neutrally charged peptide is going to exist in the highest concentration, aka that's going to be the pH that equals to the PI. So we just have to average these two numbers. And if we average, if we add four plus six, that's 10 divided by two, we get the answer is five. So the PI of this peptide with these values is going to be equal to five. And you can apply that same process for any problem like this. When you get a peptide or maybe even a longer peptide, it doesn't matter how many amino acids you have, as long as you know the PKAs of these groups, you can apply this exact same process every time, find point A and point B, average them, and get the isoelectric point of that entire peptide. And that's it for our videos on isoelectric points of peptides. Check out our website at mcatsimplified.com.